Hello, everybody. I started. Okay, yes, I started. Hello. Hello. Hello, Elizabeth. So, okay. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, kannst du mich hören? So, should I start, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Please. Thank you so much. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our today's book launch of Valuing Lives, Healing Earth, Religion, Gender, and Life on Earth. I especially welcome the editors and the authors of this uh, volume of ESVTR Studies in Religion, most of whom we will meet later and hear later, and I hope I'll also see later. I also welcome my co-editor, Teresa Toldi, and our editor at Peters, Elizabeth Hanicek. I also would have liked to welcome Christine de Troyer, but unfortunately, she has a death in her family, and she gives her regards to all of you and sends warm greetings. Our thoughts are with her and her loss. But now... Before you get to know the new book, the third volume of this series, let me say some few words about the series itself. So we uh, established it because it's still really difficult for women to publish in the academic uh, and publish their research. So this is why mostly Christine de Troyer founded the series. As you know, it aims to publish high quality volumes in the field of religious studies. Uh, and these are, are focusing, but not exclusively on feminist, womanist, queer or postcolonial issues. We see, uh, we have now three volumes. So one, two, three. And I'm really proud. The first is by Julie Hopkins. The Wings of the Spirit, and I think she brought really a good spirit with her. So, no. <laughs> uh, to start this, uh, the second volume is from Antonina Wasser. She is also here with us in this room. Uh, it's in Spanish. Nemesis, Modelo de Justicia de Mary Daly. And she's currently translating Mary Daly into the Spanish language because there's very few articles from her. Uh, already published in Spanish. And now the third volume has been published from Teresa Yuga, Sarah Robinson, Lillian Tube, Teresa Mbarihinga, William Lives, Healing Earth, Religion, Gender, and Life on Earth. I think it's a really uh, issue uh, which we need now. It's on the discussion on climate change and 
it just fits in in these uh, thoughts we are having at the moment. As a editor of the series, I would invite all of you to spread the news of this new series, spread the news about all these books, and help us to raise the profile of this series. Uh, so we invite you to buy the books, to uh, ask your libraries for subscriptions, but especially also please send us manuscripts so we can continue in the way we started. So welcome again to all of you. I'm very pleased to see you all and I'm looking forward to meet the editors and the authors of this new volume uh, in person now by Zoom. So now I give over to Teresa Yuga, I think. Welcome again to all of you. Sarah will begin. Mm -hmm. So welcome everyone. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be together today and to share this time to further amplify the rich work of this volume. Select writers downplay or ignore gender, race, and national origin among moral considerations relevant to habitat destruction and community resilience. Nevertheless, environmental injustices shape landscapes, waterways, and policies, protecting and neglecting particular people and places. In contrast, the volume's contributing authors recognize that justice is a term shaped by community-rooted and sometimes religious meaning. These case studies in Latin America, North America, Africa, and Asia highlight women who emerge from necessity as community-based religious environmental leaders. They apply local environmental knowledge through indigenous presence and memory, racial justice, intersectionality, religious reflection, ethical reasoning, and practical action. These inspiring global case studies focus on women who address intersectional injustices, envisioning and embodying earth care and community healing. These global studies offer concrete expressions of solidarity for the community of life, as described in the introduction, and I'll quote, solidarity is not abstract but rather emerges through life-giving activities, which mend the fabric of life. So it is my pleasure to welcome you all as one of the editors. My name is Sarah Robinson, and um, I'll also offer you the structure of our time together, and then we'll move forward into more good things. So we'll begin with gratitude offered by Teresa Ugar, another of the co-editors of the book followed by an introduction and invocation with Teresia Mbarihinga, another of our co-editors. And then we'll invite contributors to speak. Um, we are blessed to have the majority of our contributors with us today. So thank you all for being here, contributors. It's really an honor to have the chance to be together, um, not only in book form, but in this form as well. <laughs> Um, and then the editors will have a chance to respond um, for just a couple minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer. And at any time during our time together today, you can add a question to the chat. Um, you can find the chat in the toolbar of Zoom if you're unfamiliar. Uh, in any case, um, we're very grateful to Kelsey Ryan Simpkins, one of our contributors who's kindly agreed to consolidate the questions and bring them to the authors to answer. All right, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Teresa to offer gratitude. Okay. So every book project is a collaborative book project. This book project, we have 18 chapters. So we need to realize the amount of collaboration that went into creating this book is immense. Sarah also has commented to us in the past that, you know what, there was different conferences where these ideas emerged. So I wanna thank your, the contributors for the book for taking time and to, taking time to write them, to reflect on them and to give us your wisdom in each of your chapters. 
I want to thank everyone who is present here online, because by virtue of you being online, you are also supporting our efforts in valuing lives healing earth. Very important to um, thank is Dr. Kristen DeToyer. From the very beginning of this process in the, um, in the discernment of the ideas for this book, she was supportive. And then when, it, then when it came to the opportunity to have it published, she said, Peters will publish it for us. So I'm extremely grateful to Kristen and I will actually tell her in person as well. Gertrude, um, I'm especially thankful for Gertrude um, Ladner for hosting this um, global platform for us to talk about our book as well by for investing time and energy in our book. Equally, I wanna thank um, the European, let's see, I wrote it down. The European Studies of Women, the European, oh, the European Society of Women in Theological Studies. Because without both you and this organization, this book project would not have come to fruition. I want to thank Diane Ward, who was on um, who was on here as well, because for her reading and read, for reading these texts and for clarity, so that it is um, I would say hundred percent perfect. I want to thank Peters, the families of um, the publishers that also invested time in us. I need to thank immensely. Elise, um, Elizabeth Hernicek. She has been working with me from the beginning. She has been reading everything. I am so appreciative to the detail that she gave to our book. And I, I can't even say how grateful I am or how grateful we are. I think I want to also thank my colleagues. Okay, it's been a, the process of collaborating on this book. We've had a lot of, um, we've had a lot of incidents where we ourselves needed earth healing. And I think in the midst of it all, I feel as if that we did forge forward and it is a beautiful book. I'm not sure if Rosemary is online, but if Ro Rosemary, we need to thank immensely Rosemary for this book as well. Her book, Women Healing Earth, seminal, has um, in, in 1995, has, ha, has provided a platform for women, um, women in two third world nations to be able to have a voice and to contribute their ideas about ecological, ecological sustainability. Today, our book, the impetus for the book is because of Rosemary. And I'm gonna say most of us here who are contributors for the book also have a shared love and appreciation for Rosemary and her commitment both in life and text to environmental justice and sustainability for all. Thank you so much, Teresa and I'm there are tears in my eyes because I see that Rosemary Radford Ruther has joined us, such an inspiration to so many of us and just want to send much love to you and um, so grateful that you can be with us. Um, so, all right, Teresia, the floor is yours to offer your introduction and your invocation. grateful to invite our co-editor and um, member okay. of the, oh, are you there? Great. Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming. And thank you for being in this space and time. Uh, I would like to invite you to this space and this time and this community with an invocation which is um, a calling, an invitation to 
the great mother, the great mother who gave us all birth, the great mother who is revered and venerated around the world as Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Subukia, Kenya, Pachamama, Our Lady of um, uh, the uh, uh, Subukia, I have uh, already pointed out. This great mama is symbolized sometimes or manifests in water. And what, uh, water is life giving. You've been talking about uh, healing, uh, varying life healing earth. Without water, there's no life. Water that flows pure, water that flows uh, in, 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 in majestic and uh, beautiful ways and bringing life uh, and beauty in its path. I um, say, come, great mother, who flows with dignity and beauty, revered in Nigeria as Oshun, the great river, in India, river Ganges. May your life-giving water flow in the require, requisite and proportional uh, levels of purity and speed so that it becomes truly life-giving. I take the moment to sip some water, symbolic of my invitation. If you have water somewhere, maybe you can sip with me, inviting mama to be, to, to purify us from the inside out, inviting mama to give us life ourselves so that we can be give life giving to others. And so I take a sip of water to, sim to, to symbolize our connectedness with uh, our mama. I want to also pour some water on the earth. In Africa, we call that libation as an offering to our great mama to, 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 to help us remember that we are connected with her, that she is our ancestor. She is our great mama. I pour it also in recognition of the many ancestors upon whom, whose shoulders we have stood as we reached out and up and around us to reconnect um, our, ourselves so that we are healers of the, of, of the uh, oh, um, uh, we, we, we become uh, people who value lives and heal the earth's many, uh, uh, many, many woods. And so um, I invite you all to this space in the name of our great mother to celebrate like many mothers do, we want to celebrate the birth of a baby, valuing lives, healing earth. We gather as a beloved community of people committed Valuing earth, valuing lives, and healing earth's woundedness. We gather and promise, we make a, promise, a, a pledge to continue our uh, commitment to this project. And thank Rosemary, our sister Rosemary, who taught us for a long, long time 
that disconnected with Gaia, if Mother Earth, we are lost. Thank you in the name of our, our great mother, Pachamama, our lady of Lourdes, our lady of Subukia. Mother, thank you. May our hope for a beloved community that is, uh, that is committed to valuing life and healing earth be fulfilled and continue uh, to, to blossom in and through the conversations that will be started, that were started some 40 years ago, really, by our sister Rosemary, and which have continued uh, by our uh, the others invited in this uh, in this uh, for this book to help this book come uh, come to birth. And I would like to say the 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 Kikuyu in me wants to say. Thy, 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 guy, thy. If I, if that, if that, if I was uh, doing this in a Jewish sense, I would say shalom. If I was saying the same thing in the Islamic sense, I would say salam, peace be with you all. This is the point at which during March we say, let's give each other a sign of peace. Maybe you can do that uh, electronically, or at least situate ourselves by taking a deep breath, conspiring cause, cause together. That's what uh, some of the writers have said. Let's breathe together to invoke, to bring ourselves together to this space of creativity, of community, and of love. Thank you. Uh, well, um, as it turns out also, wherever women are gathered, there is story telling mm. in their midst. We love to tell stories. And it, it, uh, the, 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 the organizers of this uh, session uh, my co-conspirators have uh, uh, asked me to tell the story of this um, of this project of this book. So I'm the designated storyteller for a few uh, minutes here. So I want to say that this story begins back in 1996. I had just come. At least for me, uh, I had just come to teach all the way from Kenya. I was invited to teach at DePaul University to teach uh, there about African religions and African cultures. I was totally in shock and uh, uh, almost lost in a big urban, urban area. It's a big Catholic uh, school in, uh, in an urban setting all the way from a village back in Kenya. I was a little intimidated, but I didn't reckon with Rosemary uh, in my intimidation. Rosemary, having learned about my arrival, sought me out. She, 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 she was in the middle of editing this book, um, uh, Women Healing Earth. That was 1990, uh, 1990, I came there in 1994. And she sought me out. She came to, I remember she came to my apartment uh, and she having invited me to write an essay. I'm like, where do I even start? I don't even know how a computer works. Um, I'm really terrified at the thought. But Rosemary came to my apartment and literally sat with me and helped me get around, overcome my intimidation, my fear. And for, for this, um, I thank Rosemary right uh, out, out front um, for her mentorship, for her friendship, for her, her spirit of accompaniment. 1996, fast forward to 2016 and the Catholic Theological Society of American Conference in Albuquerque. 
as a new member of that um, of that organization, uh, I was invited to organize something or to say something um, to the theme of the of the of the conference that time, which turned out to be uh, environmental uh, justice. And I thought that uh, one of the ways to respond to that call from CTSC is to organize a panel uh, that would uh, 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 revisit the work of Rosemary in uh, 1996 and address it uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, of today's world and honor her legacy, honor, remember her, her work and remember how she has inspired us. Uh, when I uh, looked around for who to, in, to, to, to invite for the panel, I came across three people who totally unknown to me had had a similar experience uh, of Rosemary with, uh, with me. Uh, that is uh, Teresa Yuga, uh, Lillian Bube, and Sarah, uh, and Sarah um, uh, uh, Robinson. So they jumped to the thought, you know, like, yeah, we can do the panel. And they came and presented three papers uh, in my panel. The papers were so very well received. Uh, the, I remember the one uh, by Teresa was about, um, uh, was about the conspirat conspiratorial work uh, of women in, in Latin America while Sarah also talked about the uh, food. And when we, we did this, the, these papers, the audience were like, like um, this boy in Dixon's uh, 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 novel, please sir, can I have some more? The audience wanted more. They were not satisfied with him. You know, the tasty as they were, they were not satisfied. They wanted more, and so we came back home, and we decided to organize ourselves and edit a bigger volume to continue honoring Rosemary, but also to to invite a new thought and new uh, perspectives um, on this very important issue of our time: ecological justice or most, most often uh, lack of it. Cut a long story short, uh, we, uh, we agreed that this is a worthwhile uh, 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 venture and we called for papers. Uh, thank God for uh, Teresa who seems to have a roller deck of everybody that is, you know, that's everybody, uh, Yvonne Gabara, you know, Sylvia Marcos, others that um, I, coming from Africa, might not know uh, in Latin America and elsewhere. And they responded to the call for papers in, um, in great numbers, so many papers that what we have in this book is but a, a fraction of the number of essays that people uh, people wrote. Now, given the fact that um, uh, of, uh, of the, the limitations, uh, we can't write uh, a book of 30 chapters, that kind of wouldn't quite work. We had to select and uh, therefore leave room for volume two. We had Gertrude talking about possibilities for, for, for volume two, we are kind of ready in that, um, in that direction. I consider the four editors as midwives. The midw we midwived this baby. Uh, and the, uh, the writers themselves are the, uh, are the bad, mother, ma bad mothers of these uh, various, I guess that it was a multiple pregnancy or what if, if this was uh, in the real maternity world, it's triplets and more triplets and quadruplets to the tune of 18 babies. Um, the book is therefore, as uh, Teresa pointed out, a, 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 a result of collaboration, which is typical or among women scholars, uh, we collaborate rather than compete. 
and therefore we end up having this beautiful baby uh, in front of us. I want to say something about the structure of the book. The book is organized and along um, four sub themes, knowledge, ritual, activism, and food. Food for thought, the whole book is. I want to say though, that despite the seeming compartmentalization, these are not four, four books, one on knowledge, one on ritual, one on uh, activism, one on food, just bound together. They, it's one book whose theme is valuing lives, healing earth. And that theme cuts across uh, the, the four subsections. It's a unity uh, of thought and in integrity, a continuity of thought right across the essays. Not only the connectedness across the essays, it's also uh, manifest in the essays themselves. Quite unknown to each other, because there was no conference that preceded this Normally books are a, 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 a conference proceedings. We didn't have a meeting like this where people presented their papers and then we published. People wrote independently. And I'm amazed at the sense of coherence, the sense of like, almost like, did you, uh, did you check out my, my script when I, was, I went to the bathroom? They wrote, essays that are related to each other and internally related uh, to the theme of the book. I would give the, ex uh, uh, so, so, so that it's possible to cluster uh, certain essays together as if they were written for, for, uh, for, uh, at the request of one person. I'm thinking for, for example, uh, of the essays that focus on environmental racism, and there are quite a few, starting with Yvonne Gabaras, who looks at the intersection of gender, race, and environmental degradation, and talks about garbaging ourselves, garbaging women, and looking at how the garbage collectors uh, who live there, uh, who, who live off the garbage dumps still end up being treated as garbage themselves. And the profits end up going back to the corporations that garbaged the world uh, in, in, the, in, in the first place. The uh, recycling industry uh, ends up being a beneficiary. So there are three essays at least that I have noticed that can be clustered there. Uh, Rosalind Hinton's essay about um, extractives and their lethal impact in what is called cancer alley and, um, uh, and other essays uh, that also look at the question of environmental injustice. Internally, uh, they are also coherent and connected and could be read on their own. These essays could be read on their own as refle reflecting the theme of the book, Valuing Lives, Healing Earth. And I'm thinking here, and I'm sure they are going to speak uh, more on, on the essays themselves, um, of the, the essay in the section of food, humans and the honeybee. At face value, this is as an essay about food, a food that we really enjoy, honey, is a sweet, uh, culinary delights for everywhere in the world. But a, a closer look reveals that this essay is also about ritual. Rituals in community, uh, the, 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 the community uh, uh, says the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, um, the, um, listen, listen to the voice of the bees as you enter this sacred field. So it's about ritual. It's also about knowledge because it talks about the Jewish knowledge system, about what works and doesn't work in terms of agriculture, what works and doesn't work in 
terms of what food is good for you, the kosher and not kosher. Uh, it's about knowledge and we learn a lot about the Jewish knowledge system from that essay. Uh, the essay is of course activism. It can fit under activism because they are not only celebrating the gift of honey that we get from uh, our honeybee, they are also uh, saying, hey, that's not the only value that the bee brings to us. We need to treasure and respect and honor the honeybee because without it, our life doesn't stand. We can't, you know, the bee is a key species, what the biologists call key species. Um, and so the, the, the community in Shoresh celebrates what they fondly call our pollinator friends. And so um, that's my uh, kind of uh, story of the book, where it has come and where it's pro probably going and celebrating the baby that came out of these many years of collaboration, but also um, hoping that this spirit that Rosemary um, put in us many years ago will continue and we are going to give birth uh, in greater numbers and um, uh, in, in, in deeper ways to the whole um, uh, moral, morally imperative way of seeing ourselves and seeing the world around us. At this point, uh, I would like to invite um, the writers themselves. As I said, we are just but uh, midwives. I would like to invite uh, uh, Teresa uh, to introduce the, the writers themselves so that they can share with us um, <laughs> at a more personal level, what inspires them, what, what, what is inspiring of their essays. And so back to you, Sarah, maybe to introduce. To Sarah. Uh -huh. <laughs> to introduce, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> to introduce um, um, our sister, Teresa. <laughs> This is the time I have. I sip that water for real. Okay. <laughs> I'll just say um, that the individuals who are presenting are bisections. And um, Sarah has the names. So I believe the first person is Lillian. So please share with us about your, about your essay chapter. Lillian's there. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the book launch. We are excited to have you here. We have very few minutes, two to three, so I won't get into where I really want to get to. But hey, what was I thinking when I wrote this book? What is going on in my mind? That's about what I'm going to share with you is I invite you to uh, the text itself and to indulge in it. Uh, there are so many uh, brilliant uh, pieces in there. I wrote a marathon. And so when I got hold of the book and looked at it again, I said, well, yes, this is a marathon for real. And I did that from memory, from remembrance, from plaques that in, I encountered on the continent of African Zambia in particular from shrines that are dotted in the land, from trees, from my own biography, my own experiences, from history, from the narratives of scholars such as James Corn, who was my teacher, from my own imagination. So this is where this baby came from multiple sources using multiple genres from narrative to poetry. And 
I look at it and feel like I've told a story of the struggle, the struggle for land, the struggle for justice, the struggle for women seeking land justice for a whole people, for communities who were dis dis uh, displaced in the colonization going back before that from the displacement of enslavement is a carried to new lens. I feel like I wrote a story that connects Africa and the African diaspora. Story of the lynching trees in Southern United States captured in the narrative of James Corn, the lynching of heroines of Nehander, a disputed historical story which remains pivotal in the psychic of generations of Zimbabweans as they recreate their own history for the struggle of the land. I write a story from memory of the land that was whisked away from the natives of which I am part. I grew up in colonial Rhodesia. I experienced racism firsthand. I didn't have to read it in textbooks, no. I was on the other side of history, watching life unfold before me and those like me. I was caught up in the war of liberation. I was a child of war. And the war stories had resided in me in a place that I could not retrieve until I started writing this paper, this chapter, and I found words, some of them not so organized, others in abstract form, and some of them in vivid, terrifying flashes, the flashbacks. I didn't see me, I saw the women that I walked the veils with who invited me to reclaim galleys in the war of trees, not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end. What end? To reclaim galleys so that they could cultivate food for their families, so they could survive in semi-arid tribal trustlands. I grew up in a tribal trustland in the low veld, which is hot and dry, where survival itself, yes, was on the land, but that land was ungiving. It was relentless. It fought a strong war against communities who resisted with very little at their disposal. So when you read that story, I invite you to Yes, use your own imagination. Yes, get into the shoes of the communities I bring to life in that book. Mm -hmm. That's the best you can do. That's the best I did. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, we have four of us as the co-editors. Lillian Dubé, who just spoke, is such an inspirational speaker. Um, she is a professor at University of San Francisco. And Teresa Ugar, who you've heard from, the gratitude offerings. Um, she is a professor at Cal State Los Angeles. And um, Teresa, Teresia Mbari-Hinga is a professor at um, 
Santa Clara University where I met her as a new professor there. And she is also a founding member of the Concerned African Women's Theologians Group, um, a very important theological group in Africa. I am a professor at Santa Clara University as well as Pacific Lutheran University in the Pacific Northwest. And now is the opportunity to hear from our contributors. It's really a precious opportunity to hear from most of our authors today. And we began with Lillian Dubé, who's not only a co-editor, but also a participant as a contributor in the volume, in the knowledge section. We'll continue with Jaya Sophia O, oh, who is also a contributor to the knowledge section. So Jaya, we welcome your voice now. Hi, uh, I'm Jia Sophia O. Oh. I teach at uh, Westchester University of Pennsylvania. Uh, mostly I teach uh, religion and ecology, comparative philosophy and theology. So I kind of like um, contribute my scholarship uh, to kind of Western world, <laughs> Western world. Um, especially um, introducing some kind of Asian women's experience in Asian philosophies. Um, okay, uh, my chapter is Salim, Women and Oikos, Oikos, Home in Greek, uh, Planetary Expansion of Family. So uh, I think since uh, we have this limited moment, uh, it is good to just read abstract uh, rather than just, uh, say too much, <laughs> okay? Uh, as a political and economic system, capitalism affects all aspects of life in the places that are subject to it. Neoliberal capitalism's profit-oriented development has brought human crisis to such an alarming level of inequality and ecological crisis that we cannot but not be paying attention. In this regard, economy and ecology have been employed as disciplinary matrices in a seemingly representation of opposing concerns. Nevertheless, both ecology and economy as disciplinary matrices find a common etymological home in the Greek word oikos, meaning household. There are some patriarchal dangers, of course, to be in using such household metaphors within feminist studies due to the Western myth of universal patriarchy and the hegemony of a transcendent male mono, monotheistic God that have justified males as heads of the ordinary or mundane household. Despite destructive effects of these dangerous household metaphors, some ecofeminist scholars such as Shelley McVeigh reconstruct the term oikos to mean the whole earth as God's flourishing household, body of God, in which we are all called to live. Salim, like Shalem and Shalom, Salim is a Korean term, literally meaning enlivening. However, both Salim and woman have been inferiorized as women's house, household task by house, housewives, although they both are most fundamental entities for living in an ecologically enlivening way. This chapter suggests a planetary expansion of them for equal family. So it's not equal feminism, it's equal feminism intimating an interconnected ecosystem and an extended meaning of Salim as all diverse activities amid at enlivening a sustainable planetary symbiosis, living together, 
this holistic concern, conception of oikos not only combines ecology and economy, a su uh, sustainable living of a planetary home, but also recognize a woman who works for Salim activities as eco-feminist, such that the mutual victimization of women and naturalization of neoliberal capitalism will be thoroughly deconstructed. But I actually uh, do not uh, opposite, oppose to uh, eco-feminist, unlike Wan Ni Ho, who first brought the term eco-feminism from her kind of uh, Taiwanese Confucian background, where the fa family is the basic structure of living. Uh, but I actually, um, at, uh, at the end of my chapter, I concluded by all means that we need to hear more women's voices, especially non-Western and marginalized voices amid at decolonizing this planet called by many names, ecofeminism, post-colonial ecofeminism, Post-colonial ecofeminism uh, was my term when I uh, wrote my first book um, of post-colonial theology of life, subtitled The Planetary Parody East and West, combining post-coloniality and ecofeminist theology, ecofeminism, and so on. Ecologically yeah, healing kind of women's voices. One, you know what, because we have 12 people. Yeah. We can need I to finish be this sentence? Yes, okay. you can. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah. Ecologically healing women's movement are more vitally important than ever before as we stand on the brink of climate change and ethically hoping for viable futures. Thank you. Thank you, Jaya. I'm so sorry about that. We just have a lot of other people too. Okay. And it's such a wonderful thing to be able to hear from each of you. And wow. thank you so much for offering just a taste of the wonderful chapter that you wrote for this book, Jaya. Mm -hmm. Jaya. I'd like to share a photo um, or an image that is oh. among the really just glorious images that are part of the work and research of Rebecca Baru Davis. She's our next speaker. She teaches theology at St. Catherine University. And I'll offer now uh, for her to begin. We're now looking at the three essays um, uh, of the authors who are available today from the se section of the book on ritual, beginning with Rebecca Baru Davis, followed by Mary Judy Ress and then Sylvia Marcos. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for um, this opportunity to speak really briefly about this chapter that um, I wrote. The name of the chapter is called Picturing Paradise, Peruvian Women's Art and a New Creation. And um, I also wanna thank the publishers um, and the um, team of editors for including the color images in the book, which is really important because it's a powerful, it's a powerful piece of the experience of encountering these images. And um, uh, I want to just share with you. I'm um, uh, here in Billings, Montana, um, and uh, on my way to uh, St. Paul for. Um, a academic year at St. Kate's, but I do have the actual images. This is Selva jungle, and you can see that it is somewhat three-dimensional. Also got uh, another one called Botanica, uh, which is flower garden. Um, and again, uh, the, the actual pieces that the Peruvian women create really generate um, a powerful message. But the chapter that I wrote actually begins by just briefly describing the relationship between myself and the artist that began in 2006. And it continues on today. 
Um, it then documents a particular project initiated in, in um, 2018. And in conversation with the women, uh, the women created, and these women live in the shanty towns outside of Lima, okay? Um, they created work that addresses local, regional, and global environmental concerns, realities, and possibilities that they have. So I focus on these pieces and um, it, the chapter underscores how visual language makes apparent the convictions about the environment held by these Latin American women, thus incorporating the voices of those living on the margin. It notes the ways that in which the women proclaim their vision visually as they direct our attention to those places where environmental devastation and well-being exists and how e healing the earth is critical if all creation is to flourish. Now, um, in 2006, when I first went to Pamplona Alta, I was struck and many of you probably have encountered, you know, the austere conditions and the gray landscapes of places like Pueblos Jovenes, shanty towns, but um, the women themselves, and this is the last piece, I almost have to get up. It is actually a stole that they created and it's a creation stole. So it's act actually got the seven days of creation and ending with uh, little figures of Adam and Eve. Perhaps some of you have seen artwork like this. My, my effort has been to lift this artwork up, place it in galleries and exhibitions throughout the United States, as well as Lima where they um, live for other people to um, see, understand and experience the art and their vision of a new creation. Thank you. Thank Rebecca. you so much. Oh. Next is um, Mary Judy Ress, a founding member of Conspirando Collective and um, a writer on ecofeminism in Latin America. So glad to have you here today, Judy. Oh, well, this is this is so synchronistic because um, I also worked in Peru for many years and in Pamplona Alta. I know uh -huh. some of the people that found we must know each other somehow. This is wonderful because one of the new projects of Conspirando is exactly to take women's um, res the resistance we're, we're encountering now and doing it through um, through, through what we call here Arpilleras. Uh, and, and Arpilleras date from the um, time of the dictatorship when it was a way to protest what was happening by expressing it in, in, this, uh, in this manner. So I just can't believe <laughs> that this has happened. I also want to say that um, this is Women Healing Earth in Spanish and uh, that we produced back in uh, 99, uh, we, we translated it and I, we're hoping that Conspirando might be able to translate uh, this, newest, this newest volume so that we can read you all in Spanish. Um, I, in my article, basically I just tell the story of Conspirando, our beginnings and our, uh, our evolution, how we came together basically after the dictatorship to celebrate life, to celebrate what we wanted to celebrate. We were academics, we were people working on the ground, we were um, pastors, missionaries like myself, uh, all of us feminists. And so we just weren't finding in our, in our churches uh, what we needed to celebrate. So that's how we began. We began through uh, making our own rituals. And then we began uh, reevaluating our search for the sacred by studying creation myths and their tremendous power over us. We had a whole cycle where we came together to look at theological violence, mostly centered on the, the creation myth of Genesis. Well, because of Conspiranda's work, women all over Latin America are creating their own rituals and celebrating what we need to celebrate. 
Many of us are returning to indigenous roots here in Chile, the Mapuche, uh, in Peru, the Aymara and the, uh, and the Quechua. Um, in so doing, we are reconnecting with the Pachamama, the great mama, uh, and uh, are celebrating her, uh, her cycles and her manifestations. Images of the sacred are a key element in the very structure of who we are, of our human consciousness at every stage in the evolution of our species. Through our experience in studying creation myths and the images of the sacred contained within, them, within these myths, uh, we conclude there's a great longing for, uh, in our hearts for belonging to something greater than ourselves. In the past, we've given names and images to, these, to this longing and Conspirandos uh, had uh, an annual school where we look at, at these images and these myths and try to deconstruct them. Today, quantum physics shows that everything is interconnected in one great web, holons within holons. New images of the sacred are emerging and will continue to bubble forth from our collective unconsciousness to shape and reshape who we are. Thanks. Thank you so much, Judy. And our intention was to include Sylvia Marcos. If she's here, please feel free to unmute. I don't know whether she was unable to join us though. I don't see her in the chat box. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move forward. Our next set of essays are from the section on activism and we'll welcome Rosalind Hinton, who is an independent scholar doing oral history research and um, take it away, Rosalind. Okay, thank you. Um, my context is uh, Louisiana and uh, an area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans called Cancer Alley. Um, there's over 200 petrochemical plants there. It's uh, not unusual that they would be there, but it's also the same area that was um, a, a slave revolt in the, in the early 1800s and where there are what they call river road in the plantation uh, homes. And the plantation homes are glorified as this romantic moment, but what really is there are industries uh, um, that require cheap labor, uh, sources of water, um, and uh, uh, is, is kind of a window on the Mississippi River that takes you out into the globe with the petrochemical industry. There's a group of women who, through telling their stories, have risen up, and um, they're called and they have now um, one Louisiana, there's a number of names of these groups. And it's a very, it, it's a group that has uh, inherited the land from their slave owning great grandparents. And um, they are saying no more. We want a moratorium. You're choking us, you're killing us. We can't live on this land anymore. And um, it is David and Goliath's story. Uh, They're being successful. Um, one of the largest uh, plastics plants in the world, which is just what we need, more plastics plants, um, is trying to come there on their land, in their community, saying they will help them. They gave book bags to children, um, saying that they want to be a good neighbor. Um, and yet they know they will poison uh, this community. And so these women have actually gotten a halt uh, from the time that I wrote this article. They have now halted uh, 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 the plant's growth and are demanding uh, the Corps of Engineers reevaluate. Um, they have halted just in the past two years, I would say. This is a small group of women with very few resources. Their resources are growing as more people hear about them. They've halted, I believe, 
uh, four petrochemical plants now in this 190 mile area. Um, what is the trick though for all of us to become involved, to, to, to join in solidarity, not only with our money, but uh, uh, our, our political advocacy. Um, the other thing that, that happens is these plants can be defunded because they need bonds from, from banks to, um, to get the billions they need to build. And, and so they have, they have really become the prophets. And I think we see them in every community. Uh, Lillian Dubé was talking about her own. You're talking about people with different visions in Peru. So this is just one more area where I think our, our book comes together and, and we're seeing these little areas of, of uh, creative revolution and that we need to support and, be, and be a part of. And so that's what my chapter is about. It, it shows the obstruction to creative revolution, but it shows the building of creative revolution. Thank you so much, Rosalind, and for your work. It sounds very crucial to amplify these people's experience and to help more people understand what's happening on the ground there. Next, we will have Aruna Gnanadasan. She's directed the Global Program on Women in Church and Society, as well as the Justice, Peace, and Creation work of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland. She uh, is in Chennai, India, I believe, and um, we're very grateful she's able to join us, though it is very late in her time zone. So thank you so much for taking the time. Aruna, are you still listening? Unmute, oh, oh, unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it's uh, just past midnight, so it's not too late as yet. <laughs> uh, it's good to be with all of you and to be in this grand com com company. Uh, I was the, from the time this was announced for me, the thought of meeting all of you was so exciting that uh, I just was waiting for it to come, the day to come when we will all be together here. Uh, I think for me too, what is important about my article is that the whole book, in fact, has come up, come out at a moment when it is needed, when we need to make Christians to think more about what's happening to the earth. Because, I mean, you've just seen within the spate of a few months, we've had floods, we've had uh, earthquakes, we've had cyclones, we've had hurricanes, we have had, uh, what else? Everything. That, and there is water, water everywhere. And many parts of the world are literally disappearing because of what we are doing to the earth. And... Uh, Forgive me, Pamela, but all the cops of the United Nations Environmental Organization and everything that is done is making no impact. Our governments are not serious about really calling back what they are doing to the earth. They cannot. We've gone too far into this um, mode of taking of the earth to become wealthier, that to give that up is almost impossible for any of our governments. So all these little things that are done to sort of appease people that we have done so much, so this is how much we have cut off our carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera, is just making, doesn't make sense. And where does the sense lie, actually? At this moment, it is in people's movements. And it, it is in these communities of tribal and in India, Dalit women, 
who are producers of survival, as Vandana Shiva, the famous uh, environmental scientist, has said, uh, they are the ones who have wisdom for us an ethic of care with which they are taking care of the earth. Communities who are resisting all efforts to stop their movements. In India, we have some terrible police brutality against these people's movements, and yet they come back, and they come back, and they come back. And of course, big business gives our government loads of money and uh, business. So they are allowing them to continue to do what they are doing. We have just two or three big business houses in India who are controlling about half the economy of the country. And these are Indian uh, businessmen, not multinationals. And then you add to it the multinationals. So they make a good uh, partnership in destroying the earth. I feel that an eco-feminist vision that is very strongly present in the movements of the people, in what they say, in the language they use, the uh, kind of imagery that they use in their struggles are so feminist that we are just being uh, the, the context is Right, it's there for us to develop a new attitude to the earth and to try to imbibe that new value system and attitude to the people of the earth. And I end my article with this reference to the new images of God, which are also emerging out of their movements. It's really theirs, and we are just getting it into because as feminist theologians, we recognize all that Christianity has done wrong in the world and recognize where there has to be a rejigging of theology and of the church. And it is in people's movements, in the voices of these women, that these images of God are emerging, which give us hope and can sustain a truly bring about the change with the United Nations or everybody who claims that they are on the way to saving the earth, they will never be able to do. So I just say, let's listen to the women and listen to the earth. And from there, will wisdom come. Thank you. Thank you so much. What wisdom, truly. Thank you so much. Sarah, how many people are left just to know? Yeah, we have Pamela Brubacher, Adrian Crone, Laurel Marshall Potter, and Kelsey Ryan Simkins um, okay. on behalf of her and Elaine Noguera Godsey and possibly one Tavares. So we have. Okay, so we um, have five. I, what my, I recommend is that you read your the abstract that you sent to us because we are um, at 12. I'd, I'd like, yeah, yeah. Can, I think so because then everybody just will a be off of each of them and, and yeah. we'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. So I welcome Pamela Brubacher, Professor Emerita of Religion at California Lutheran University. Thank you. And I'm going to read. I'm glad you asked that, um, Teresa. My chapter focuses on the defense of our Mother Earth by Indigenous women and our response to their call for solidarity. So, you know, I'm speaking as a first world, uh, you know, white woman with some privilege and aware of the complicity of my country um, in so much harm around the world. So um, th there's a question then of, um, also, you know, the, how do we respond to these calls for sol solidarity? In 1985, I wrote an article on sisterhood, solidarity, and feminist ethics, and I've struggled with that. So uh, since retirement, I've done different delegations, and uh, my chapter focuses on re uh, delegations to Peru, Guatemala, and Honduras, the latter two in which the U.S. has played a very destructive role, supporting coups, et cetera. Um, and um, the, what um, I, 
It brought to life the hu horrific human and environmental impact of chemical mining, deforestation, and hydroelectric projects, as well as the courage, persistence, and faith of communities engaged in peaceful resistance in the face of repression, criminalization, and violence. And I talked some about Berta Caceres from Honduras for the US supported a coup. She was murdered, you may know her case. So I'm amplifying the voices, which we were asked to do. Go back to the US and amplify uh, the voices. Um, so I look at the possibilities, but also the limits of solidarity, because in spite of our work, um, to go to the U.S. Embassy in Honduras, they didn't hear our voices. So I learned that solidarity also means that we need to offer political support to the women in these precarious uh, circumstances. We need to rethink our own connection to the earth, which we've heard. And I believe it's really important. Our mutual survival is at stake. This is for all of us. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pamela. Okay, next we have our authors from the food section. We'll begin with Adrian Crone, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Director of Jewish Life at Allegheny College. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Um, Teresia already actually talked about my chapter quite a bit, so I can be extra quick. So um, I wrote about the staff at Shorish Jewish Environmental Programs in and around Toronto, Canada. And they focus a significant portion of both their, their land that they steward and their labor resources and educational programs on bees. Um, the pollinator population in Ontario has been subject to degradation, much like the pollinator population all over the world. Um, and has experienced a significant amount of colony collapse disorder where entire colonies um, die out. And this is due to varied factors, um, including industrial pesticide use, invasive pests, wild habitat loss, and climate change. So the women-led staff at Shorish um, strive to protect and cultivate this vulnerable bee population through an effort that they call community-supported beekeeping. And so in the chapter, um, I talk about what that means and the kinds of um, rituals that they do, the kinds of educational programs that they do to bring Jewish folks and non-Jewish folks um, in Toronto into their beekeeping efforts and into their pollinator repopulation efforts. And a lot of what they're doing is this really innovative blend of Jewish ethical teachings and sustainable environmental practices. Um, and so the Shorish staff are kind of at the forefront of thinking about um, not just themselves as we, as we head into climate change, but also about the vulnerable um, animal populations around them. And um, one, one of the things that I highlight here is that I, I study Jewish farms a little bit more broadly, um, not just this one farm in Toronto, and most of the farms are still led by men. They tend to focus on land and fundraising and producing their own um, vegetables and programs. But Shorish has really focused on collaboration um, and on um, sustainability and community engagement and some of these other things that um, are maybe not as exciting to funders or not as exciting um, to um, national organizations promoting things, but are, are the kind of real work on the ground that we need um, in the face of the climate crisis. So um, it has added to um, a broader study of Jewish environmentalism um, that, that I'm um, a part of. So I will end there and pass, pass the microphone along. Thank you so much. And I'll share an image from her research as well, that we're grateful to have in color in the book. Um, there's some beautiful photos uh, included in the book. Okay, so next is Laurel Marshall Potter. She's um, working in systemic and comparative theology at Boston College. Welcome, Laurel. Hi, everybody from Boston. Um, 
I'll be quick too. Upon receiving my copy of this incredible book, I was beyond pleased to find my chapter in the food section because I think there are few categories as useful for uniting theological reflection and justice seeking praxis as food, especially for women, especially for the earth, especially for other impoverished and marginalized beings. Um, my piece intends to demonstrate how trust in local and marginalized epistemologies that differ from what is defined as knowledge in the epistemic north can be essential for creating initiatives that decolonize our food systems, gender roles, and anthropocentrism. Uh, one such initiative that I describe, Campesina School, is an agroecological curriculum for rural young people in El Salvador who have discontinued their formal education in the school system. Um, it was designed and executed with the leadership of local women and non-literate farmers. Um, we incorporated indigenous local spirituality and lived or popular Catholicism into our lessons. Uh, we went to political talks and marches on a national level to connect our local efforts to national campaigns between um, to learn from others working towards the same dreams. Um, we made explicit connections between crops, the object of most male work in rural El Salvador, and food, the object of most female work in rural El Salvador, trying to blur the boundary a little bit between both crops and food and men's work and women's work. Um, and I hope that this window into rural resistance to all oppression helps spark insight for those of us who struggle to imagine other possible worlds. Thank you so much, Laurel. Wonderful. And Kelsey Ryan Simpkins and Elaine Nagaro Godsey work together on a chapter. And I'll welcome Kelsey to offer uh, a bit about that chapter. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's such a joy to be with all of you today and to have worked on this chapter with Eleni. Um, our central question in thinking about this was how can those in North America build authentic transnational solidarity in response to the day-to-day -day effects of climate change on those, um, especially in the global south? And so in our chapter, um, we are arguing that food and sustainable agriculture provide this tangible foundation for actions of solidarity. Um, so we look specifically at three sustainable agriculture projects in central Ohio in the United States, where both Eleni and I are located, um, and use these projects to look at how women who are involved in sustainable agriculture are using that to learn more deeply about injustices in the food system, both locally um, and also globally. Um, how they're using those experiences to become active in other movements for social environmental justice, um, and how working in sustainable agriculture, uh, they were able to understand growing food as a moral action um, that had connections to their various religious and spiritual backgrounds. Um, so we, we argue that the, these local actions of these North American women are tangible responses to food injustice that fosters solidarity across geographic and social disparities that are caused or exacerbated by climate change. Um, we hope that our chapter honors the key role that women's work as sustainable food producers worldwide play in resisting globalized industrial agriculture and promoting nature's well-being and human flourishing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I believe Juan Tavares is unable to be with us. Is that right? No. I'm actually here. Thank you. Oh, you're here. Juan. Fantastic. All right. Now we're grateful to welcome Juan Tavares to speak about his chapter. Thank you. Buenas tardes, jóvenes. So my name is Juan Tavares, and I'm the author of the Tianguis, see, a Mexican model of green ideology and philosophy. I just want to say that Tianguis are the uh, farmers markets of Mexico and Latin America, and that they are the origins of Latin America's uh, ecological ideology and philosophy. In Mexico, the Tianguis were known to be the, the place of divine origin, of beauty and law and order. So if Mexico wants to preserve its uh, ecological ideology, it is forced to save the Tianguises that are constantly attacked by this neoliberal economy or global economy 
that have come into Mexico and the tianguis are being now replaced by their uh, good items. They're being replaced by SWAT needs. So in order for Mexico to keep its green ecological ideology is obligated to preserve the tianguises, not only for us, but for our future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you to Lord. all of our contributors for offering, offering just a taste of these fascinating and such important works that you've added to the volume. It's so inspiring to hear all of your voices today and just be reminded of all of these communities that you're representing as well, the communities that you're working with, that you're amplifying the voices of through the work that we've done together. I'm also grateful to report that we are on time for finishing our uh, panel of contributors. And we also have the opportunity, if you're interested, to continue the conversation today during Zoom or and otherwise. We have um, a panel at the World Parliament of Religions coming up. The editors will be offering time at that conference. There's also an opportunity at AAR um, or the American Academy of Religion 2022, the Women's Caucus is interested in highlighting our volume. And we welcome other ideas that you might have for where, where this volume can do the work of, of solidarity and improving the lives of women, healing earth and all of us. Um, so let's see, the next step that um, we plan to do is to have the editors offer responses and then have an open discussion with questions in the chat. If you would like to stay, you're certainly welcome. It is now 12.30, so if you need to go, we certainly understand. Um, if you have a question, feel free to type it into the chat. Thank you all for joining us. This has been such a, a wonderful time together. Teresa, please feel free. I just wanna say that you're able to get 35% off of our book for being here online today. So there is a flyer, hopefully that flyer, the majority of you have seen it, but the information to get 35% off on our book is on that, okay. It may be 25, 30, 35, something like that. Um, in any case, there's so. a flyer with, what's that? Oh yeah. Maybe, yeah. I want... a, 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 a hefty discount that we're happy to pass along to you as um, participants today. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat. Um, if you'd like to stay on, feel free. If you need to go, we wish you well. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to invite Lillian to offer the first editor response amongst us. Well, thank you again for that opportunity. It was... Um really a humbling experience uh, reading and editing the works of these great scholars. And in this uh, three minutes, I've been asked to respond to four people uh, uh, who spoke to me in profound ways. Literally every single one of you did, but we distributed this. It's important to highlight that. We distribute this uh, uh, essay. So each one of us is about four or five. Uh, and this doesn't mean they are my absolute favorites. No, I loved everyone, a single one of the essays that I read. I read every single one of your essays and was blown away. I will start with uh, um, the essay by Gebara. I really would have loved for Yvonne Gebara to, uh, to be here, but she speaks in a essay, garbaging the environment, women and ourselves, about capitalism's uncontrollable th uh, uh, thirst for profit. She highlights uh, consumerism and uh, zeroes in on the uh, 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 production of garbage. 
um, is a process that garbages women, particularly. Uh, she uses the case study of uh, black women in, in Brazil and how they become garbage or how they are garbaged in the process of recycling garbage. They find themselves trapped in a cycle, vicious cycle of uh, poverty. They won't break are free, they end up stinking they are in, in their minds. And what she does is make us all stink. You read that chapter at your own peril, you're going to stink. Uh, by the end of that chapter, you will be uh, motivated to jump up and uh, do something about that stench. It follows you, you feel it, you smell it, it just overwhelms you. And that's what Gebara does. She goes on to uh, analyze what garbage is, and then who uh, um, uh, the trash collectors? They are the, they are women. They are poor. They are black. They are diseased. So she deals in this chapter uh, with the intersection of class, gender, and racial identity of poverty. The racial identity of poverty. Uh, this is not just the only uh, chapter like Theresia Hinga highlighted at the beginning that deals with this issue. Uh, there are uh, um, other uh, uh, papers that do the same. So this is an intense uh, uh, paper. Uh, Alisa Moore, who happened to have been my student for two consecutive <laughs> uh, semesters at the University of San Francisco. So yeah, go dons. Uh, um, carefully navigates the Catholic theology and a theological sources that establish solidarity among creatures, something that is profound. She makes a textual analysis, which um, uh, is helpful in uh, the analysis of the experiences uh, shared in this book. And um, Aruna, who is here, I think every minute now, <laughs> Aruna takes us to India and, um, and, and shares the, the stories of Indian women passionately and spiritually protecting life from fake development. And uh, every uh, single one of those stories will inspire uh, us to see the intricate um, uh, conni conniving uh, devices of coloni colonization, neocolonialism, neo or working in the name of development uh, to subjugate sources of life uh, for, for the women and their communities. And not only do we look at that, we see the push the forces that push back uh, these forces. I was so happy to listen to Aruna articulating the vicious reprimand uh, that come from the police pushing back these women and yet they do not give up. And finally, there is, so we move, move from, um, from, um, from uh, Gebara uh, in, Bra in Brazil to um, the United States with, uh, with, with um, Alisa uh, to India, and we end up in Africa with Rosemary Ruter. Rosemary takes us to Africa uh, in her essay about Wangai Matai, who again reiterates or speaks on the same, hammers on the same point about uh, co colonialism and uh, the cultural erosion that comes with it, the denigration of African worldviews that support the ecosystem and challenges us to, to dig uh, to, to dig back and uh, which is what Ma Wangari Matai does. She is uh, presented by Rosemary as the prophetess, a visionary um, a, in, in her tree planting, which is not just tree planting, it's not isolated from uh, food security, uh, water harnessing um, uh, processes and a civic democracy. They are all intertwined and Rosemary does a fabulous job showing us this holistic uh, approach to saving lives and saving the environment in the same vein because the opposite is true. That's about it. Okay, I actually wrote some comments too. So I just want to say, in terms of all of the articles, I mean, I was just so impressed 
by the depth of the content, reflections, and analyses within it. And um, I will comment that I wanted to say that I appreciate Rebecca's article about women in Peru and Pamela um, and her work in Honduras, Guatemala, and Judy in Chile, because I want to say that you're similar to Rosemary. Because in Women Healing Earth, what she did was use her privilege in a positive way to give a voice to women that would not have a voice. So I want to commend you and thank you for carrying on that legacy for, of Rosemary. Of course, Ivone Gabata, that wonderful article about you know, critiquing the system of women, trash and colonialism and capital money over profit. I wanna say that I appreciate Jaya's article because she engages um, creatively the syntax and imagery um, of an ecological perspective within a Korean context. And I th really think that it's important that the work that we do arises or engages the culture and the ideologies that form them. I will say the same thing for Adrian. I really appreciate as a person, a scholar in religion too, that you know what, that you're reflecting on B's sustainability within a Jewish context. I wanna say for one, I I'm, I'm appreciate your article because I think the, we need to have more analyses about US involvement and the, we need to have more analyses about the origins of the destruction of ecological um, spaces in Latin America and Mexico. So just to highlight, I mean, Mexico or Tenochtitlan was the first ecological city in the Americas. So in a US context where Mexicans are deemed are, are undermined, um, I think his, art, his article is important because he elevates the ecological wisdom. And let me see, did I, Aruna, I appreciate your lifelong work for creating an, um, an ecofeminism again from within your um, Indian context and I don't, did I comment on Lillian? I can't remember. Lillian, um, your, your essay and was integral to the book. And I'm gonna say why. Because you were able to draw connections from slavery and the Middle Passage in Africa to um, slavery here in the United States and then to lynching. And here we now, here are we now um, um, dealing with issues still of racism because the way I see it is that racism is still in the DNA of US history. So there is a lot of work to do and I appreciate everyone for the, um, taking the time to write these beautiful articles. So Teresia will go next. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, I uh, already uh, did comment uh, somewhat in my introduction, uh, but I, I have been listening to the presenters themselves and getting a, a, an even uh, deeper sense of how, um, um, how magical almost this whole thing uh, has been. Uh, I was uh, touched when uh, this is the first time they're seeing each other and they listen to each other and they're like, what? You know, you just took the words from my mouth. That's exactly what I've been thinking. That was really wonderful uh, to hear that there is a symbiosis, uh, whether we, 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 we recognize it or not uh, in the thinking that all these women uh, bring. I also want to comment um, on uh, Aru uh, Aruna uh, Granadason and um, rem re remember that this is the second time she's participating. Yeah. She was in the original Women Healing the Earth uh, book. And in today's talk, she highlighted the importance of um, people's movements. And in India, 
and uh, the people are not just victims of all this oppression. They have agency and they are pushing their own case in very commendable ways. Uh, I want to add that uh, this is a good, uh, the, 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 um, the essay about Campesina schools reminds me of the, the movement, the people's movement that's gone global, the Via Campesina, the people's movements around the world gathering together and pushing for an alternative to globalized capitalistic uh, neoliberal um, action that are uh, destroying everybody uh, in their wake, including the environment and ourselves. Uh, so I'm kind of responding to what I had here. Uh, and uh, Rose, uh, Rose, Rosalind's essay, I uh, had al already touched on it. I liked the way she highlighted the fact that the women in Bat Baton Rouge, in Louisiana, are not just victims of uh, extractivism, but they are pushing back and uh, making uh, some uh, uh, victorious moments, as has been the case around the world, uh, despite uh, martyrdom. The, the whole idea of martyrdom came came up in the in the some are losing their lives in the in the struggle, but they are gaining victory. The challenge is for us to join hands. So that solidarity becomes very important. Um, there is one essay that uh, uh, I think the other didn't come, and of course Yvonne Gabara is one of my favorite essays because it talks about the intersectionality of everything, and it also uh, puts us right there as part of the problem. We are garbaging ourselves. We are garbaging each other. You are garbaging the world. And so long as we kind of comply, we when we don't challenge uh, the, the the oppressive situations, we become part of the problem. The essay I want to refer to is the one uh, by Frederick. The enclosure of the psyche in modernity, healing the internal and external landscape. I don't think she was here, was she? Uh, but her essay spoke to me and is, uh, is, is important given the overall theme of the book. The theme of the book, the proposal by all these feminists is that when we are connected with mother nature, when we are connected with the spirit world, Contrary to what we were told after the enlightenment, you know, there is no such a world that if it exists, it's a pie in the sky, it's forced consciousness. And we bought into that uh, myth uh, of the scientists. And as Wangari says, we got on the wrong bus. Wangari Madai says, we got on the wrong bus. Uh, uh, that is going to take us into, you know, into, in, into um, uh, perdition, if you wish rather than flourishing that we desire. And so this thought is captured by Frederick, who talks about uh, the, the enclosure, the imprisonment by modernity that we are all going through. We have been captive of modernity and almost forcibly disconnected with the, the, the world of Pachamama, the world of um, Mother Mary, the world of the saints and so forth. And this has come with a cost. She says we are therefore sick to the core. Mental health issues um, arise out of, of this um, uh, destruction of nature, food that is not really food uh, because we poisoned it, because we are uh, growing it for profit. And so the essay sums up part of what uh, is I think the proposal of the book overall that we need to reconnect. We need to reconnect as we were supposed to, uh, to be. Uh, the interconnectedness of everything, when we forget that, then we perish. And so we need um, to value ourselves, value life, including our own lives, uh, and begin therefore the healing of our inner landscapes, she says, our inner selves and the outer landscapes, those honeybees, preserving them, those rhinos that are reduced to the last one 
the white rhino, there are, there are only two left in the world and they had to do some urgent uh, kind of artificial insemination so that the you know, that's uh, uh, as the uh, landscape and the world out there is perishing, that's coming from our inner perishing and our inner sickness. We are captives of modernity. We need to yeah. liberate ourselves by valuing lives, then we can begin the healing process. I'll leave it there uh, and just celebrate the, the symbiotic thinking that uh, has showed up. Mm -hmm. Totally, you know, um, uh, uh, this is the first time or, or, or anybody was seeing, other than the editors, this is the first time um, the writers were seeing each other. And they're like, like, wow, pleasantly surprised that they are thinking similar thoughts, even if they have never consulted. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Teresia, and thank you to all of the editors for the tremendous work that has gone into the volume. Yeah. I'll just offer um, the last uh, bit that I had signed up to do amongst us. Um, so we each took on a handful of essays to represent now, and I'm also, um, I'll say that Sylvia Marcos is a, a really significant um, scholar from Mexico who writes in both Spanish and English, and her work for this book um, is looking at what she calls women's medical pluriverse, and a pluriverse is getting into the cosmological thinking of an indigenous um, understanding that she is um, doing research with, and so understanding not only our bodies in relation to the cosmos, but our our bodies in relation to our local lands and waterways, that this is um, part of the healing elements that um, can be invoked through traditional medical practices. It's just a wonderful article that brings this to light. Yuria Solidwin offers mythopoetic earth-based creation storytelling, deriving from relationships from grandmother to granddaughter and in interrelations with ecological context in an indigenous Chiapas family. Um, J.S. Sophia O brings eco-familialist um, post-colonial contributions to the Korean ecological Salim movement and deconstructs household norms of gender and economy. Um, and Lillian Dubé, of course, does this difficult work of weaving together narratives of enslavement and resistance embodied by legendary resistance fighter Nahanda Nayakasakana. Please forgive me if I didn't say it correctly, um, whose memory lives on even after her memorial lynching tree has fallen. And as editors, we labored for years <laughs> to bring this volume to fruition, adjusting plans and forging forward amidst deaths in the family, um, with the Me Too movement bringing more human bodies to protest in the US Capitol than ever before in history, with indigenous land and water defenders standing together in global solidarity, with COVID spanning the globe amid fear and human frailty, um, the Black Lives Matter movement focusing a stark lens on ongoing injustices, contemporary legacies of history's horrors. But as you can tell from these inspiring stories, the story does not end with those injustices. Those of us present with the gift of life have the ability and arguably the imperative to act, to render this world more just, more free, more livable. And in addressing environmental and social issues, we don't need to be less bad, but to embody and work towards the good, right? The volume renders significant lives and stories visible, rendering women visible, not through a media lens shaped to further entrap and extract from them, but amplifying them to render subjugated voices audible to a wider audience. This is the work of feminism and contemporary eco-feminism and the intellectual stream toward liberation that preceded us and will live forward beyond our lifespans. And 
my plan had been to end with the poem that I have at the beginning of the book, but there's think... time. There's time. Mm -hmm. Is there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. So I will offer my poem called Bone Blessing. Our bones, legacy remnants of long past travelers who like us breathed this air, the same blood pulsed through tissues now turned to dust. We now are living dust, living bones, living waters, singing the same mystery song without answers. We breathe and sing, dance through sorrow, rise in righteous fierceness, caress in gentle forgiveness, delight in celebration. These bones return to the wellspring, pulsing life through every tissue, every idea, every moment, gratitude for healing, for the passing of life from body to body, breath to breath, bone to bone. Blessed are the living and the dead. Blessed are the bodies and the lives yet to come for whom we are ancient ancestors. May we prepare this ground here for them, soften their steps with petals, protect them with canopies of leaves, save seeds for their harvest. May we honor this moment here, these hands here, working this precious ground here, beloved bone dust, cushioning our bones as we step forward from here. Mm -hmm. I think it's important in the ecological, in our efforts for ecological sustainability that we have a long-term vision. Rosemary had that model for us, a consistent long-term vision. And in the process of the work, we need poetry, we need dance. We need to nurture ourselves and we need to be around people and collaborate. So I guess today or our book is an invitation for you to consider um, your eco um, the work that you would like to do for ecological sustainability and try to be in solidarity with um, others, whether in North America, Africa, and Asia. Okay, thank you for coming. Gertrude, where are we okay? Mm -hmm. You're okay. Okay. Um, thank you all. It was really amazing hearing you all, seeing you all. Thank you really very much. Okay. If you are agree, then I will close down the meeting in yeah. some minutes yeah. or even thank now. Yeah. So, uh, because it's very late here, <laughs> even <laughs> later in India, but. Okay. Uh, Yes. We can't thank you enough, both you and Elizabeth. Thank, thank, you, you, thank, you. thank, thank you. Thank you. It was okay. an amazing meeting. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. So. Yay, we did it.